Welcome everyone to another session of uh, conversations about COVID-19 and more from the McGill Office for Science and Society. And for those of you who may not be familiar with us, our office was uh, uh, founded 20 years ago uh, with a mandate to separate sense from nonsense, uh, fact from folly, and to make sure that the public is up to date on what is happening in the world of science. And we deal with all sorts of issues, from cosmetics to food additives to medications, uh, plastics, everything that is of interest to the public. And of course, these days, there is nothing of greater interest than uh, COVID-19 and uh, very difficult to find anything else to talk about. It is the topic of conversation, and that's why we're having these conversations. Behind the scenes, monitoring everything and making sure that your questions get answered and having her finger on all the right buttons most of the time is Emily Shore. Uh, also joining us is uh, my colleague, Jonathan Jerry, and uh, his background is molecular biology, so he's very up to date on everything to do with COVID-19. And uh, also joining us today, as she has done several times before, is Dr. Debbie Schwartz, who I think I have known since the moment that she was born. And she's an emergency room physician and uh, works at a hospital here in, in Montreal and, of course, is at the front line treating COVID patients. And uh, obviously, we are going to start a discussion <laughs> about masks. Uh, why not? Right. So, Debbie, you're wearing a mask, even though we are not uh, transmitting anything through the airwaves. Why? Um, OK. So firstly, so I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I clearly don't need to be wearing a mask and it's basically to prove a point. I mean, I'm sitting here all by myself. Um, so I absolutely do not need to be wearing a mask. So that's something that I want to um, bring up is that, um, you know, if you're, if you're by yourself, if you're in your car, for example, you don't need to wear a mask. The reason why you would need to wear a mask is really um, if you're in a crowded place with multiple other people and uh, and you want to protect the other people from yourself. Um, if you happen to be symptomatic or, well, if you're symptomatic, you should not be going into a crowded place, but if you're an asymptomatic spreader. So I did wear the mask just because I want to show you um, um, what it is since a lot of people are asking um, how you wear a mask and um, the techniques behind it. Um, uh, so basically, this is a this is called a procedural mask. This is a surgical mask. Um, so you've got the two loops here and a couple of of layers of tissue here. Um, and when you're putting on the mask, the important thing is that you don't actually touch the mask itself, but you're only touching the loops around the sides. Um, as soon as you're touching it, you are contaminating it. Um, so you basically just put it on like so and wrap it around your ears. And there's a little bendy part at the top that you kind of pinch around your nose to tighten it. And if it's a little bit loose, you can turn the, the, the loops like this and wrap them like that. And then the other important thing is the, is the way that you take it off. Um, you should be taking it off by the ear loops, removing it like that, not on your chin. You don't want to protect your chin. Your chin doesn't need to stay safe. Um, your ear doesn't need to stay safe either. Um, so take it off like that, throw it in the garbage. Um, it's finished, this one. Um, it, this one is uh, disposable. Um, and then the ones that are not disposable, you would want to do the same thing and then basically put it in, put it um, on, onto um, a surface where you're not going to be touching the, the outer part of it. Um, and you should definitely buy a couple of them so that you can wash them and interchange so between them. I just want to reiterate because I also had the same question. So basically, with the non-disposable masks, like the cloth, math, cloth masks, as soon as everything starts reopening and we kind of start going out to more stores and back home and work and back home for some of us, we should probably be having more than one mask on us in our purse, in our bag or whatever. So we go out to the store, we wear it, we come home, we take it off, we put the laundry. Oh no, you forgot to do an errand. You're going back out again. You put on another mask, you do that, um, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, obviously, I'm in a different situation when I'm working with patients. When you're out, I would say with a cloth mask, I mean, as long as you're not handling the outer part of the mask, and you just take it off by the loops, I would say that you're probably, you're probably okay. Hand hygiene is crucial. So keep a, a keep a hand sanitizer in your car, wash your hands before you go to take it off, and then wash your hands again after you've taken it off. I see people out walking and bicycling with masks. 
uh, for which there is no scientific evidence whatsoever. You do not catch this disease by walking by someone for a second. Uh, we are now getting pretty good idea of exactly how this thing is transmitted. <clears throat> yes, it can be transmitted through the air, but just like we say with toxicity that it's a question of uh, hazard uh, and exposure, that's how we evaluate risk, here it is also a question of the hazard and exposure. Uh, the virus, of course, does present a hazard, but you need a certain viral load in order to be infected, and you need exposure for a certain amount of time. Now, of course, no one is quite sure how long that time is, but it is not a few seconds. So walking by someone on the street is not the way that you're going to catch this virus. Indoors is the real problem. That's where it spreads. And that's why we're seeing all of the spread in the old age homes. We're seeing it in the meatpacking places because there are people work next to each other, breathing the same air for hours at a time. So uh, I think one has to be you know, quite reasonable here and not go overboard and think that when you're walking down the street, everyone who walks by you is a lethal uh, hazard. But they have, so anyway, we have today, more. breaking news about children and this novel infection that is being found, uh, which has some resemblance to Kawasaki disease, although it's not exactly the same. And uh, it seems to affect uh, many uh, organs. It's a multi-system uh, inflammatory uh, disease, and that's what it's now being called. So Debbie, maybe you can just give us a little bit background here on what Kawasaki disease is and what uh, doctors are looking for in terms of symptoms and uh, what the chance is that this is really connected to uh, to the virus? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, I, I mean, I, I agree. It's very relevant to talk about uh, pediatric presentations of COVID. Um, up until basically a, a couple of, you know, weeks ago, um, it has seemed like COVID has not really had much of an effect on children. It has generally, they have generally been presenting as asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, maybe with some mild fever, cough, some gastrointestinal complaints. Um, but um, within the past um, couple of days, there was a report that was sent out from the National Health Service in England that basically said that over the last three weeks, there had been an apparent rise in children of all ages with multi-system inflammatory states um, that required intensive care, care in both London and then across the UK, and that these were sharing common features with toxic shock syndrome and, and atypical Kawasaki. Um, so this is obviously breaking, breaking news for us. Um, so what is Kawasaki? Um, so typical Kawasaki, it's actually one of the most um, common vasculitides of childhood. So vasculitis, it's an inflammation of vessels. Um, and uh, Kawasaki presents with fever um, associated with some other findings. Um, fever, generally, so fever is five days um, in order to diagnose it. So it is a clinical diagnosis. There's no uh, diagnostic test for it. Uh, so it's five days of fever plus four out of five of the classic findings of rash, uh, conjunctivitis in both of the eyes, um, that's non-exudative, which means that there's no discharge coming out, uh, redness and swelling of the hands and the feet, uh, mucus, mucus membrane changes, so that would be something that we call strawberry tongue, which is basically a very prominent red tongue, but even cracked lips can fit that um, criteria. And then cervical lymphadenopathy greater than 1.5 centimeters. So that's the basically, you know, the way that we diagnose Kawasaki. Um, generally, Kawasaki is a self-limited disease. Um, the inflammation will generally last for about 12 days. Um, and uh, it, it's really more the complications of Kawasaki that are concerning. Um, and those are coronary artery aneurysm, um, which can lead to heart failure, heart attack. And that obviously leads to significant morbidity and mortality if it's not treated properly um, and in time. Uh, so the treatment for Kawasaki is um, intravenous immunoglobulin with aspirin. Um, and so the, and then, and then follow baseline, uh, cardiac echo and then follow up, uh, cardiac echo. So these children get followed up for a long time. Um, uh, we, we don't really know what the cause of Kawasaki is. So that, this is kind of what, I mean, it kind of seems to be the theme with, uh, with 
COVID actually. So some, some ideas of what the etiology is, um, is an inflammatory response. Um, or it could be an infectious trigger. So, um, so actually, uh, uh, Kawasaki has actually been previously linked with other epidemics uh, in Japan. Um, and then it can al also another another possible etiology is uh, genetics because we see it more commonly in Asians. Uh, so the, the, the cases that are coming that have come out of uh, the UK, though, uh, they seem to be atypical. So what that means is that the children are presenting with fever and then only two or three of those findings that I mentioned, the rash, the conjunctivitis, the swelling of the hands and feet, the changes of the mucous membrane and the cervical lymphadenopathy. Um, so it, it, they're all case reports. I think that it's it's really it's too early to tell if uh, if this is of uh, uh, of some kind of importance. Uh, here in Montreal, we have not had any cases to date um, at Saint Justine or at the Children's. Um, the case reports that came out of the UK, I mean, the numbers were very small. So we're looking at uh, 12 kids in the UK that required ICU, and then 20 cases in Italy over a one month period. But this is for sure a, a a dramatic increase in the in the incidence when you compare the the incidence of um, of Kawasaki over uh, the past five years in Italy. Um, I had read somewhere that they had had 19 cases over five years and then 10 cases over a period of three weeks. So uh, this is this this looks interesting for sure, um, but uh, we don't have enough information to hang our hat on right now. Let me bring Jonathan in, in here because, you know, there's so much talk about testing and this is the key thing is, is testing people to, for example, in this case, whether these kids have a test that demonstrates that they've been exposed to the virus, you know, and so there's a lot of talk about the ser serological tests and testing for antibodies. What, what does that really involve? <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, so as you mentioned, um, I, I just read there, there's a, an article in The Lancet about those cases uh, from Italy that have this Kawasaki-like syndrome following uh, exposure to the coronavirus. And so the the, the start of their symptoms uh, was about between days four and eight of, of having a fever. And so by the time uh, you get them tested, the, the, the typical test that we're familiar with here in Quebec now with the swab going, you know, way back uh, up your nose uh, to extract the genetic material of the virus, uh, that test may no longer work because that the, the genetic material from the virus may not hang around very long. Uh, so then you get into the, the other type of diagnostic test, which is the antibody test. Um, and that is what they use. I mean, they also use the, the, the PCR test, the genetic material test that they use, uh, but they also use the antibody test. Here in Canada, uh, there's only one antibody test kit that has been approved so far. Uh, there have been a lot of applications uh, in the United States. Uh, they applied, uh, they, they, they essentially gave, it's not even an emergency use authorization, it's just like a blanket, sure, go ahead and use it kind of uh, approval that the FDA gave them. And now they've kind of rolled it back and they're trying to go back and say, well, hold on a minute, let's let's make sure that these tests actually work. Uh, whereas here, Health Canada from the start was like, well, no, let's uh, give me, uh, you know, if you're the company, give me proof that your test, your, your kit works before we're going to approve it. And so the one kit that is approved right now is by Diasorin. Uh, it's called the Liaison SARS-CoV-2 S1, S2 IgG test. Uh, and IgG is the most common type of antibody found in the blood. Uh, and so uh, the way that this works is that you uh, essentially take uh, blood from, uh, from, from somebody uh, and um, you, uh, what, what the kit has is it has these magnetic beads and on the beads are parts of the spike protein from the coronavirus. And if you have antibodies against these spike proteins, then there will be a binding and that can be detected by the kit. Uh, they are reporting very high sensitivity and very high specificity of the test, which is good. Uh, those are those are numbers from the company. Uh, I would love to see an independent evaluation of that. But uh, this was good enough for Health Canada to to uh, allow for the uh, the the sale of this particular antibody kit. Uh, but that's it. That's for, for for now. It's the only one. Not cheap. Not cheap, as I understand. I haven't seen the price. Do you have you seen it? Uh, Two hundred dollars. For how many samples? Oh no! The, so the the charge to the patient is. Or, oh, I see. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's not insignificant. Although I suspect people will be willing to pay it. Uh, there's also the question of of uh, false negatives, false positives. 
with all of these tests, including with the PCR test. Of course. They, they just had, a, a, actually on the news tonight, a report of a physician who had four negative tests in sequence and yet came down with the disease and is on a ventilator after mm. four, four times being tested and uh, coming up negative. So the, there's a lot of uh, stuff, uh, you know, left to desired with these, uh, with these tests. Yeah, I believe it because I'm seeing it with my own two eyes. I mean, I, you, you see a patient in the ER who's classic COVID, who has the classic uh, chest x-ray or CT findings and the COVID test comes back negative. But I mean, fortunately, we're not buying one negative test if uh, if the symptoms are correlating with, uh, with the disease and we're repeating it. And I have seen them turn positive uh, when repeated 24 hours later. But what about, so, what about yeah. after, um, you know, Dr... Um, uh, David Zlotnick was here a few weeks ago and they said in Israel that after your, you do your quarantine and 14 days after you're positive, they're not allowed back, they. Israelis are not allowed back out after, unless they have two, uh, uh, two negative uh, tests. So do we have anything like that here? Or uh, I've heard that some, I mean, some people cannot even get, test, get tested to begin with. So is there a follow-up with patients after or can someone just go to the store and go buy a loaf of bread after their 14 days if they feel okay? So I do, uh, I do agree that Israel has taken, not surprisingly, a really impressive stance with COVID. Um, they reacted early and they put, uh, they put measures in place very, very quickly. So that's where I think that they have, uh, that's why they, they, they are where they are right now. And they're able to return to, um, they're able to start the deconfinement process. We do have the same thing in place for healthcare workers. So you're not allowed to return to work uh, unless you have two negative, uh, two negative tests. Um, for the general population, testing has opened up. Uh, so generally now, whereas before we, we started out only testing symptomatic patients, and then uh, and then we there was a period of time where we couldn't. Uh, get enough tests to even test patients that were symptomatic and we were making clinical diagnoses and now we're back to testing symptomatic and even some a some asymptomatic uh, more if you've had a, a close contact I would say so but we are testing a lot more and that I think that that is really what's important if we're going to start the deconfinement process it's going to be about as Dr. Zlotnick talked about testing and contact tracing. That's what's so important. And so that's what we need to ramp up. And we are ramping that up. So I, I see yeah. that they're, they're outfitting buses as testing centers and they're going to move around the city. And I know my understanding is that you can just go and be tested. Yeah, there's yeah, there's mobile units set up in various locations in the city, um, uh, and we still have a screening test in our in our uh, setup at our hospital where we we are freely screening. Um, so patients are coming and they get screened in the tent. If the nurse who's doing the test is concerned about them in any way, she'll you shall pass them along to the emergency room. But they send home many patients directly from the tent. But let's say this bus testing thing works and, and people to go and get tested. So you go and you have a negative test. But what does that really mean? Because as we see, you could go the next day and then be positive. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I think that there is a, a false uh, sense of reassurance uh, that goes along with a lot of tests. I could think of many tests that are similar uh, in medicine, um, but Again, I mean, I, I think that the false po the false negative rate right now, the latest I heard was about six percent. Um, so, I mean, if you're negative and you're that's better than the false that's better than the false positive rate that I heard in the states anyway, which was sixteen percent. Which are false positive? Yeah. yeah. F f uh, sorry for the antibodies. For the antibody oh, so testing. I'm, I'm, antibody I'm not talking tests. about the No, but that's good. Test. Right, right, right. But that's, that's, so that's significantly lower anyway, like that. The anti, so I actually think that it's important to make a clarification yeah. because. There's two um, tests. The, there are two tests, exactly. Yeah. So what I'm referring to is the PCR test, which is the nasopharyngeal aspirate. The so that's the one. Yes. Yeah, so that's the one where, where the Q-tip is put into the nose and takes a sample from the nose. Um, so the. 
the antibody test uh, is it's a blood test and the, the blood test as of now, from my understanding, um, is not uh, particularly um, good. <laughs> Uh, it's not particularly well, the, well there, 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 are, there are many kits out there. That's the thing. And and some of the kits in the U.S. have terrible performances. Uh, but the one that's been approved by Health Canada, according, again, to the, the, the user's guide put out by the company, the specificity and the sensitivity is very, very high. Uh, now, those also uh, depend on when you're testing the patient. Because if you're testing the patient at the beginning of the illness, then it's not going to be as good because you haven't made enough antibodies for them to be detected. So that's also dependent on when you test a person. So what uh, you 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 are recommend you would recommend it the the. Serology? I'm not a doctor. I'm not recommending anything. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> lo lo looking looking at the the specificity and the sensitivity of the test that has been released by this one company that has a health Canada approval, the numbers are very, very high. What They're are the high sensitivities and specificities? I will give them to you in a second. Because I mean, we I do have lots of patients asking me about this and I, do, I understand it. I mean, it makes sense. Obviously people wanna know if they have been exposed to COVID. I mean, I think that, you know, we still, we're still not 100% certain whether you can be infected twice, but I'd say that the chances are, if you've been, if you have antibodies, y your body doesn't develop, you know, this huge revved up uh, immune response that's going to land you in the ICU. Yeah. So, for example, um, if if it's been at least 15 days since the onset of symptoms, uh, in 39 samples that they tested, the sensitivity was 97.4%. And the specificity for routine laboratory tests, and that's 90 samples, that was 98.9%. Those are good numbers, except that the, the, the samples are not good numbers. Yeah. But also, yeah. you make a good point, Jonathan, because the antibodies um, take some time to develop. But if one gets tested in the, at the beginning phase, then they may differ than, you know, 14 or 15 yeah, days so, after. So, but why would one even get tested for antibodies at the beginning? Oh, you mean without displaying symptoms? If they weren't, if uh, not, this is not like a patient in the hospital that would get an antibody test. No, but I, I suspect that the company uh, needed to show these things. And so, for example, if uh, in, in samples that were taken from, from patients who had had symptoms for less than or equal to five days, the sensitivity was down to 25 percent. So it was, it was terrible. But it goes up the longer you've had the symptoms because you're making more and more antibodies. And so you're detecting them more easily. Well, yeah, course, so you sort of have that, that inverse relationship between the serology and the the PCR test because right. as you as you go as you, one curve goes down, the PCR curve, then the antibody curve goes up. Exactly. Yeah. So that's something to you know to bear in mind as well. Depending on what you know point in time you are, you may choose one test over the other. But currently, the the only recommended test is the um, the PCR diagnostic test, which is the nasopharyngeal aspirate. Um, really uncomfortable one. <laughs> and of course, we know that the uh, U.S. has the best tests, the most beautiful tests, and they are testing the most people. They have uh, the most tests, obviously. I will say that. They have a yeah. lot of kits out there. Yeah. So, Jonathan, I mean, uh, in the last couple of days, we've seen Trump pick a fight with Dr. Fauci, which is, is so bizarre that it is beyond words, where, you know, on one hand, we have an expert who's been leading <laughs> scientific figure for 40 years, on the other hand, we have someone who has no idea what he's talking about. And uh, we, we have the situation now where uh, basically Dr. Fauci is, is losing out to, to ignorance. And um, uh, Trump is, is taking sides with the people who are demonstrating to have everything opened up. And uh, uh, he wants all the schools to open up in spite of uh, the most recent warnings about this Kawasaki-like -like disease. So, uh, look, you, you said bizarre. I would not say bizarre. I would say this is part of Trump's MO. I mean, this is this is what he does. If, if an expert disagrees with them, then he goes against the expert. I mean, he's worried about the economy. He's worried about his his reelection. I mean, there's 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 there's, there's he's not concerned about scientific validity of, of anything that he says or anything that he does. I mean, that's that's shouldn't be surprising at this point. That's just it's oh, just Trump. No, Trump is impervious to facts. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. They're just. Yeah. All right. Let's leave uh, that alone. So we have uh, some, can I ask some more questions? Because yeah. people are asking um, about masks because as things are reopening, more masks are being worn. So 
Um, I, I, there's two questions. And one says, um, what about the eyes? Because the masks, you know, cover nose to, you know, chin, but the mask, uh, sorry, the virus does enter through the eyes. So what does the mask even do for that? The mask doesn't address the eyes. Obviously, you're not going to walk around with a mask over your eyes. You could wear glasses if you want. Sunglasses are a good option. Um, but again, I mean, you're not, the idea is that you're not getting close enough to people to have them spitting into your face or, you know, sp speaking and moistly as Justin Trudeau Speaking says. moistly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you if you really want to be secure, uh, you could wear sunglasses, you could wear a visor if you want, although I, I, I really don't think that that's necessary. Um, but yeah, absolutely, the mask will not protect your eyes. Um, I, have, I have a question that I know is for me, but I know other people um, also share it. Um, there's a lot of, you know, fashion companies that are now making masks and doing great things and prints and trying to make them an accessory, basically. Um, but how does one make sure that the masks that people, um, you know, these solo companies, um, people are, are, are doing masks, how are they, what should they be looking for when it's not just one piece of cloth, right? It's, there's a little bit more to it, I think. Um, so generally, I actually don't think so. I think that any face covering will do, a scarf will do, um, a, a little, you know, a little bit more um, cloth will, I, I mean, in theory, potentially protect you, you know, offer a little bit more protection. But the, the goal is really to keep your respiratory droplets in. And I think that a scarf does that effectively. So I wouldn't be too concerned. I would choose, you know, a mask that you like, a mask that feels comfortable for you. Um, it should fit you snugly though. It shouldn't be loose. And again, uh, you should not be wearing it on your chin or on your ear. It should really be covering your mouth and your nose and you should not be touching it. And just wait until you see the mask that I got for Dr. Joe. I, w I will add one uh, one one word uh, one note about about comfort. Sorry, as Doc saw that. <laughs> I will add one note about comfort, uh, which is that I, I think what we might be finding out is that uh, companies that have a lot of experience making masks uh, have figured out you know, the best materials, the best elasticity for the loops to make the mask as comfortable as possible. Now everybody is making masks. I bought some reusable masks. And they are well made in one sense, but at the same time, they are really pulling my ears down because the the loops are not well made enough. Uh, and so, so that might be the issue that some masks may be a bit more com a bit more comfortable to wear than others. But as Debbie said, I mean, if if it is covering from you know the, the bridge of your nose down to under your chin, uh, and it's not made of cheesecloth, you sh you should sh you should be fine. And and I will add that there, if, if it does bother your ears, there actually are ear savers as well that you can wear um, that are little pieces of plastic that go in the back of your head, and you could attach the loops to it. So that right, might that might uh, save your ears. All these are all new business ventures oh, for people. Yeah. Hold up the mask for a second. Hold the, the mask you have. This. There's an awful lot of technology in that mask. And for those people who say that they don't want any plastic in their lives, mm -hmm. and of course I've had arguments about that, uh, this mask uh, is ingeniously made of several different kinds of plastics. The main one is polypropylene. And uh, if it weren't for plastics, we would not have those, uh, those masks. I just like to throw that in to all the plastic haters and who say that we should get rid of all plastics in our life, which of course is, uh, is absurd. So we have, a few, uh, we have a few more here. Um, mm -hmm. One more. Um, um, okay, with, with, in Canada here, we have a long weekend coming up. And in the States, there will be one next week. And as the weather is improving, uh, people are going out. And you could see it. You could see in all the parks around. There are clusters of people that were never congregating in those particular parks before. So um, this one, the question says, what about multiple people and kids gathering in backyards or parks? Is this a, a worry for adjacent neighbors? I mean, aside from the noise, I, I assume she means in terms of um, virus spreading. Um, okay, so <laughs> this, this, this kind of brings me back to the, the, a little bit of a hint of the conversation that I had started about schools reopening. Um, so I think I will just preface this by saying that um, I am not a public health expert. 
Um, I am a doctor, I'm a mother, and I'll give you my, you know, my opinion. Um, and at the end of the day, all of this, all of these are opinions. Um, uh, I, I think that, uh, I think that moving forward, uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of what we have labeled quarantine fatigue. And I think that this is really important to address because we cannot continue in this social isolation permanently. Um, it's, it, it is, it is um, detrimental to our society. It is detrimental to our children. Um, it is on so many levels. I think that there's so much collateral damage from COVID. So now that schools, as of today, have officially uh, declared that they will not be reopening um, until September 1st, um, my personal opinion is that um, children need something. Um, they need to um, uh, outside. Um, so I think that this this was a great segue because you mentioned the backyard. So I think that outside um, to interact with other people, in my opinion, uh, is within within reason and within uh, you know a small bubble of people. I feel that that is okay. Do I think it's a risk to your neighbors? No, um, I don't. Uh, your neighbors are uh, hopefully more than six feet away if you're hanging out in your backyard. Um, I think that the the chill it's, it is more important at this point to address the needs of ourselves as social beings. Um, and I'm not saying to go and hang out in a pack in the park because I have seen teenagers doing that and I do not condone that at all. But I do think that there is a medium uh, in the middle that we can... Uh, that we can strive for um, within reason. Well, as a non-social being, let me add my uh, opinion to, uh, to this. I think if you are sitting out in your backyard doing whatever it is that you do in your backyard and your neighbor is in their backyard, I would say the chance of this virus being transmitted is zero. So I would have no concern about that. I, I have very little concern about viral transmission outdoors. I think it's, it's very unlikely given how the air circulates and the viral load that, that you need. Uh, it is indoor that you really have to think about wearing, uh, wearing a mask. And anyway. I think that that's why it's so important to um, do something, you know, going forwards. Um, I think that, you know, the importance of day camps um, or some kind of structured activity for children um, is going to be so important moving forward. Except I have a question because um, I 100% agree with you and there has to be some way to kind of move out of this rut a little bit to, to make this is our new normal right now, at least. So I, I agree with you. However, there's also the balancing, I feel, in terms of like the slight trauma that people felt. And um, I know that you said that you would send your kids to school when they were going to be reopened. And I have other friends, and I'm sure you do too, that were not going to do that. More so because the school that every child wants to go back to no longer exists, or not right now. And so, you know, having to go into a schoolyard or go into a school and have your teacher wearing a face shield or picking up the two-year-old because it's a preschool and the parents can't, you know, go and they have to wear layers. I mean, it was, it is crazy what has to be implemented, but if, but that is what has to happen. So there's also the mental, there's a mental um, struggle there as well, I think, that it's not the school the kids think of. They want to go back to their old school like we want to go back to our old lives. We just know better right now. Yes, but whether we go back to school, well, at this point, we're only going back in September, but that will be a problem in September as well. The, the teachers will be wearing PPE in September as well. And our kids will not be returning to school as they knew it. Um, and our lives are not going to be returning to the way that we know it. So I think we have to learn a way to live with COVID in our lives right. and take a few inches forward. Because again, I mean, yes, we are at our peak right now. And so we, we, are, we are still nowhere near ready um, for you know, dramatic deconfinement. But I, I, I think that I'm not convinced still that children are the super spreaders that, that uh, you know, some people feel them to be. I, I just, I'm not convinced about that. I've just read too many, too many, too many reports stating otherwise. And um, I, I just, I don't think that, that, that that's the answer is to, you know, continue to shelter our, our children. I think that they're suffering tremendously. And I think people are suffering in general. I mean, I can tell you that 
the number of, of patients that I speak to um, on the phone when I'm doing my my um, my family medicine visits, the number of elderly people you know who live alone, the the depression, the anxiety. I mean, it's it that's the, the trauma, and we're going to be ex- suffering from this this post traumatic stress disorder for a long time coming. And I think that we need to start figuring out how to how to deal with it and how to address it. Um, so you know, I, I don't think that keeping keeping people in their bubbles uh, the way that they are now is the answer. Um, I mean, as someone says here, and she's right, they're right, you know, it's about controlling the virus and not stopping it right now. Um, But that also kind of leads into another question here that we got um, asking about, you know, different strains of the virus and what is, is there any evidence showing the different strains? You know, can it morph? Jonathan. Well, again, um, you know, the word strain means different things to different people. And I think to to many clinicians and to the public in general, uh, two different strains of the virus means that they behave differently, right? That one might be deadlier, deadlier than the other. But to molecular biologists, a strain is just a version of the virus that has at least one mutation compared to another one. And in that case, there are hundreds of strains, well, at the very least, well over 100 strains of this coronavirus. Uh, but, you know, once in a while, there is a story that pops up and says, oh, scientists have discovered a new strain of the virus. And that study always gets a lot of criticism, a lot of pushback from scientists. So if you're worried, like, is there another strain of this coronavirus that is that is deadlier, that is behaving differently? The answer so far is no. Uh, and the virus is relatively genetically stable. Uh, is it possible that in the future uh, the virus might mutate randomly in a way that will make it, you know, harder uh, for us to treat it when we do have, tr- you know, specific treatments, or that will impair any vaccine that is in, in under development? Uh, that's a possibility, but it's not something that we've seen so far. Well, as Jonathan says, uh, different strains mean that you have. Uh, different segments of the DNA being different in, in, in the viruses, but it depends on where that segment is located on the DNA, that is, which gene has mutated. And it may be uh, a sequence uh, on, on, on the gene that is totally irrelevant in terms of the infectivity of this virus or, you know, or how it re- reproduces in the body. On the other hand, if you have a, a mutation somewhere in the spike protein, that may be a, a significant difference. It so may be, yeah. It may be, or it may, it may not even be. And yeah. I'll give it. I'll give a good example. Um, you know, because when we hear mutations, we always think, oh, something bad is happening. Uh, that's not the case. Most mutations are neutral; they have no impact whatsoever. And part of the reason for that is that uh, the genetic code, whether it's DNA or RNA, uh, is read in groups of three. And each each set, each of these three uh, in a row will code for a particular building block of the protein that is being made. That's that's the whole purpose behind this genetic code. And there are redundancies in the code, and so uh, there are a lot of instances where that third base could be any one of them, and it would still code for the same building block of the protein. So uh, if you do happen to have a mutation in the virus at that third position, it may very well be that the uh, the, the protein that is being made from that gene is exactly the same. Uh, so there are all of these redundancies at play there that make it so that even when you find a mutation, it, it does not mean that it has a deleterious effect. It, in many cases, it's completely neutral. Or it can even be positive. I mean, it there can. are many, many mutations that have uh, had positive effects. If you look at some of the mutations that we, we see in food, you know, there, there are positive things like the, the pink grapefruit or red grapefruit is brought about by a, a positive mutation. Uh, I don't think that this coronavirus is going to mutate itself out of existence because that's not how viruses work they, uh, evolution-wise. But just because there is some genetic difference between uh, two viral particles doesn't mean that, that you're developing a totally new dangerous uh, strain of the of the virus we have some another question um kind of looking at grandparents i mean debbie you were expand you said that you know expanding your cluster or your nucleus a little bit um actually one of the questions says dr schwartz do you see your grandchildren um so maybe you want to answer that um and then also we can talk about a little bit should you expand your nucleus i mean how much you have to trust your your uh, the grandparents i mean uh, yeah, let's say here, Joe, maybe answer if you see your, your grandchildren. 
and then uh, I have, yeah. I have been there and we have communicated from six feet uh, uh, apart. Uh, I see them on on uh, face uh, FaceTime, uh, but uh, no, I've not gone into the house. Am I allowed to come into the house? No. <laughs> no, so I, I don't, I do not recommend um, that uh, I personally, okay, so first of all, I'm obviously in a, in a, in a, you know, a little bit of a diff different scenario because, you know, I, I am a, 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 a vector risk, you know, a constant one, whereas other people who have been social, socially isolating for a prolonged period of time and have not been exposed to, um, to coronavirus, they, you know, I, I would feel much more comfortable with them having their, their grandparents come over. Um, but for me, I, I think that it's definitely just too risky. Uh, if, you know, it's so variable. I think that if the, if the grandparent is immunosuppressed in any way, it depends on the age of the grandparent, you're definitely taking, there's risk, there's inherent risk. But listen, at the end of the day, what, you're not going to see your grandchildren for the next two years until hopefully a vaccine is, uh, is, is invented? I mean, let's be realistic, you know, and I think that this is an important, this is such, this brings me back again to, you know, the, the amount of collateral damage that comes from COVID and our world, unfortunately, as you, when my dad opens this, you know, he talks about how, you know, COVID is, is all we talk about. It's all we think about every day. And, and it's been going on like this for two months, but Trust me, there's lots of other issues going on now that are not COVID and that they are getting shoved under the rug or they are getting ignored. And this is so dangerous. And in my opinion, this is what's going to be the big killer in the in the grand scheme of things. Um, people are coming into the emergency room, uh, you know, when they way they, they're waiting way longer at home. So the acuity of the disease is so much more severe. There's been an increase in domestic violence. Um, inter I mean, interestingly, there's been a decrease in child abuse reports, but I think that that's simply because the tw about a quarter of the reports come from teachers. And guess what? These the, these vulnerable um, families, these vulnerable s children, they're no longer in their safe places. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that uh, we're going to see the effects on our kids uh, going forward. Um, studies have shown that, you know, in world, in, during World War II, when the kids lost, you know, for every year of education loss, there was a 10% a reduction in their income, uh, uh, you know, when they're older. I, I think that there's just so many effects of COVID that we, we have to stop ignoring. Well, uh, Debbie and her husband sent over to me, uh, a sample of poop. poop, poop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't and, tell my sister. <laughs> what did they send? A sample of what? Pulled pork, oh. which I guess just made. And I'm not going to be scared to 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 eat this. And I bring this up because, of course, this is a question I get so often about food being delivered. And and my friend brings me food. Should I worry about it? There is zero evidence of anyone ever getting sick from uh, uh, this particular virus being transmitted by food. It just doesn't work like that. This is a respiratory virus. Even if it's in the food, it goes straight down the esophagus. It, it's uh, metabolized in, in the stomach. But the thought, food is not, the thought of the that is, is too much. What? Just thinking about it is, is hard. Thinking about that, like eating the virus, if it was on food. Yeah. Listen, a, a lady calls me today. And she says that she she gets her baguette and she brings it home and she immediately puts it into the oven to kill any virus that may be on the baguette. This is, is absolutely ridiculous. And then she follows this up by telling me that she takes her morning newspaper and she puts that in the oven too. And she wanted to know how long you have to put your morning newspaper in the oven to make sure that you're not going to catch COVID from it. Uh, th this is uh, absolute uh, nonsense. In fact, put that newspaper in your oven, you're going to release a lot of toxic stuff from the ink. And I would really worry about inhaling that. But can I ask so, you, but, but, but again, this is... Newspaper in the oven, Emily. Okay, <laughs> I won't put... That, one, that wasn't me. Yeah, we, we stopped our paper. But, um, but I do, though, have a question because I, at some point, really want to go... I miss getting a coffee. I miss going to Starbucks. I miss, you know, I really miss that. So this past weekend, I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. This has this a reality or whatever. So then I went into the store. I called them ahead and I said, I'm outside. I'm going to walk in. 
can you prepare this? How are you? Are you wearing? You're taking precautions. Yes. And I have to say, you know, nothing has changed in, in Montreal and Quebec now versus six weeks ago because our numbers are still the same. The fact is things are reopening, but the difference is, is that now business has kind of adjusted their their way of, of doing business. So that makes us feel better with the red, you know, X's and where to stand and all those things. But I saw that they were wearing gloves and she told me she was going to be washing her hands, but she was not wearing a face mask. So again, you're talking about something with the food, passing with the food. And I placed my order and I said, you'll be wearing gloves though, right? Or you'll be washing your hands. And she said, yeah, for sure. And I said, and what about the face mask? And then she said, no, we're not wearing face masks. And then I took a second and then I said, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. And so I walked out of there without my coffee. Um, and then I thought to myself is, should that have made such a difference? Because I know other coffee places um, are doing that. And whether it's peace of mind or something and they're touching, you know, the cover. I also wasn't going to have the cover. I was just going to use the cup, um, I, you know, ingesting the food, but I'm busy putting my lips on the cover that they're doing their preparing with. So you don't have to worry about putting your lips on that because you're not going to catch this through your, your uh, drink or through your food. So ingesting doesn't equal respiratory. That's right. And I suppose this is unless, unless you inhale your food, I guess in theory, I've if been you known did to, my, food, my husband would say that I inhale know. my food. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do. I mean, I think that, yeah, face coverings in places of food. I mean, Starbucks does carry food, so it would make sense that it would be yeah, mandatory I, yeah. to wear face masks. I do agree with that. And it, I mean, the glove business is also a curious thing because you can be wearing your glove yeah. and you touch your face with the glove. The stuff is still there on the glove. It, it's no and difference. Well, I mean, we, we saw food delivery people that literally were holding the bags and doing everything great. And then he's opening the door and then he's op taking his phone out of his pocket, holding the glove. I mean, that is not the point of the glove. So it's almost better to wash your hands. And well, as a matter of fact, glove wearing has been, it, it, studies have shown that, uh, that glove wearing actually leads to more contamination. Uh, so I, I definitely don't, people ask me about gloves and I say, yeah, that's a hard no. Okay. There's actually an interesting video on YouTube that I had watched of, of a woman wearing gloves and then she puts like a little bit of paint on it, on her face, and then it shows how, how she contaminates herself completely with her gloves. Her gloves end up completely uh, full of paint and her face and her arms as well, her phone, everything. So it's, it's an interesting video to watch. Uh, any more questions, Emily? Um, yeah, I mean, this is someone, she says she, she apologizes for not being science um, literate. But I think it's interesting because, Joe, you'll like to talk about the GMOs also here and genetic modification. Maybe you want to talk a little bit just about vaccines. We've talked about this with Brian Ward, but and I think Paul Offit, just how it's developed, because it says a, a vaccine is being developed by modifying the DNA of the virus. Is it safe? If eating GM, GM food is not recommended, then what about injecting a genetically modified virus? Can it cause bigger harm if it mutates? I apologize if my question is dumb. So I think that's not a dumb question because that is what we answer here. And I think Joe might want to talk about that and also GMOs and how they are not dangerous for you. There's no such thing as a dumb question. I mean, if, if someone really doesn't know and is eager to find out, it's, it's, it's not a dumb question. But this, this would require a pretty long lecture to talk about uh, GMOs. Uh, there is no issue about GMOs in terms of health, the, the food GMOs we're talking about. There's no issue. There are some economic issues, some social issues, some political issues, but there, there is no health issue there. Now, with the vaccination, look, any time that you do anything to the body, whether it's a medication or a vaccine, there always is some risk associated with it. And this is why it is going to be so critical to test the vaccines that are being developed. And there are a number of vaccines that are being developed. There are over 100 companies working on this. And there already are dozens of prototypes which, which hold out some potential. And, you know, when, when you talk about having a vaccine available in about a year, what they're talking about is having one available to be tested, not that it is going to be ready within a year for uh, distribution to the public. As you mentioned, any time that you inject into the body, any novel substance, there is a risk. And vaccines do present some risk. So it's going to have to be tested. And that testing is not a day, it's not a week, it's not a month, because you may not see the effects for quite some time. So until we are going to have a vaccine 
that has been shown to be safe and effective is going to be a very long time. We're talking years for this. And there's not going to be one vaccine. First of all, because no one company is going to be able to produce vaccine to, to use on billions of people. There are going to have to be many different companies producing the vaccines. So I don't know, Jonathan, you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, I can maybe disentangle where the confusion lies uh, with the sort of modifying the DNA of the virus. So this coronavirus does not have DNA. It's an RNA virus, but there are similar, um, similar molecules. Uh, what many of the vaccines that are being developed, uh, the way that they work, uh, and the reason why DNA slash RNA gets gets into the into the picture, is that instead of uh, giving people the virus that is inactivated, or giving a part of the virus, like the protein or or, or sugar or sugar that is associated with the virus, uh, what a lot of these uh, vaccines that are being developed, what they're doing is that they are giving people a small part of the RNA, so the genetic material of this coronavirus. And they are uh, putting this into a little, a bit of a vehicle, if you will. And inside, when's this, once this gets inside of our cells, uh, our cell machinery will take this and will make the, the viral protein. Uh, and that will trigger an immune, I mean, that's the hope, that it will trigger an immune reaction. Uh, so these are RNA-based uh, vaccines. Uh, so there are not, the, the, the vaccine does not change the virus itself. Uh, the vaccine is essentially a small part of the genetic material of the virus uh, so that the one of the protein, the spike protein at the top of the, of the virus will be made inside of our cells, will be recognized as foreign, and will train our immune system to develop a good solid response against it so that when you do come into contact with the coronavirus, uh, your cells will remember it and will mount an attack very quickly. Very good. You know, unfortunately, and throughout history, there have been uh, vaccines that have been developed that had to be put aside because they, they either were not effective or they uh, resulted in very significant side effects. So developing an effective and safe vaccine is very, very challenging. And I think we have to be careful not to put all our eggs into that basket. There also has to be a lot of work on, on uh, developing medications that can control the symptoms and treat the disease. And I think that the chance of having something effective along those lines, uh, I think is more likely than the development of a vaccine in the near future. Well, that what's, and, that, that's the yeah. HIV, like that would be the case of HIV and AIDS, correct? That there's no vaccine, yes. but there's a treatment. For 35 yeah. years, for 35 years, uh, uh, they've been trying to develop a, a safe, effective vaccine, <laughs> but, uh, Oh, there, I so I, I do see my grandchildren. There you, you go. See? Even the, even the dog. Uh, all <laughs> the grandchildren. And, and, and they're all, all there, and I see my grand pup as, uh -huh. uh, as well. And, and there they all are. So this is the this is the way I, I really do get to to see them, and I get them to, get to, to everyone. That they they look like clones. Yes, they do. De <laughs> Debbie, have, you, have the, you perfected I human cloning? <laughs> <laughs> That Shiloh, and there's one more. One more is you stick your head in there. Stick your head in there. Stick you go. Your and uh, there in the background is uh, Samson. Uh, holding Samson is the man who pulls pork. Uh, we actually, we actually have someone that says, "Don't leave your pulled pork out of room temperature. It's going to get too much bacteria on it." Yeah, well, that that's a bigger concern than. Right. Uh, the coronavirus. But you know, I have to say, there's a lot of there's a lot of comments on my coffee um, example because I think people do resonate with that. And it, and just just I know we're going to wrap up, but but they did say I mean basically someone could sneeze on my coffee lid and I won't get COVID, but someone could sneeze in my face and I could get COVID. And I guess that's the yeah. that's the aerosol component and the droplets and everything. And I also I guess that's the risk one takes when getting a coffee in this time, right? Yes. But the acrylamide in your coffee is a bigger worry. Okay. We, we, we get into that. Okay, so that's about it. We're running out of time. I think we covered a lot of interesting uh, issues. I have to uh, meet my grandchildren. And, uh, get face -to -face and we'll be back again next week. And uh, talk about Thank you. Thank you. The only thing that we can predict is that it is unpredictable. Because who would have predicted that today we would have this warning about this? this
which everyone is going to be talking about tomorrow. Yeah. So you can never predict what is, is going to happen. This, this virus is inherently unpredictable. So I can't tell you exactly what we will be talking about next week, but I can assure you that there will be something that we haven't even thought about today. Okay, so thanks very much thanks for being everyone. with us. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.